Well, uh, I'm very, uh, very pleased to be here, and uh, I'm very thrilled to be talking at uh, Functional Medicine Grand Rounds. I've been to many. They've all been quite remarkable. And I, I, I'm trying to think about what I could add to this, uh, what I could add to the uh, corpus of these conferences. And um, <clears throat> we're immunologists, or rheumatologists, we take care of immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. We call them IMIDs. It's a big family of diseases. I'll talk about it a little bit uh, in terms of orientation. And we have some remarkable therapies, remarkable therapies. And uh, we do a lot of good things for our patients' disease. But um, uh, I, I will make the point uh, that you recognize uh, uh, so well uh, that there are dimensions uh, of disease and illness uh, that far outstrip uh, the ability of any molecular target uh, to address this. And, uh, over the past uh, decade, I've become increasingly interested in this issue of professional behavior, or personal behavior um, and its influence on these diseases. So I'm going to skip the objectives, which are, are in your handout, and I'll go to my outline. I, I'll give you a high-level view of what IMIDs are. And I will be talking about rheumatoid arthritis because I think it's prototypic. I it, can't talk about 100 diseases, but I'll talk about one. Uh, I really want to focus for a few minutes on the concept of wellness. This is very important and central to your mission, our mission. And then I'll talk about some of the things that we generally talk about uh, uh, in terms of data on diet exercise and, and spend a little more time on, on mindfulness. And then I'll give you a snapshot of something that we're developing um, uh, that, I, that hopefully uh, might be of interest uh, to you as well. So uh, the, the, the term image was actually coined uh, as a neologism probably uh, almost 20 years ago. And um, uh, stands for immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. And it, uh, it basically says that uh, uh, it refers to a family of diseases that probably have shared mechanisms. Uh, they use shared pathways of immune perturbation. Um, you know, when I started my training, uh, if you would have told me that uh, we would have the same disease for uh, rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile inflammatory arthritis and uveitis and spondyloarthritis and Crohn's disease, it, it would not even have resonated. Now it's just um, inculcated into our, into our fabric. Um, and it's, it's uh, uh, something that we have come to accept. And this is kind of the first wave of IMIDs. These are diseases that, um, uh, uh, where we have shared pathways, shared medications. And I throw multiple sclerosis in there, B cell targeting, uh, um, some differences, but many similarities. There's another wave of IMIDs that are chronic dysregulatory inflammatory diseases um, that are now you know, uh, kind of uh, on the cusp, uh, and that is everything from uh, diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, um, uh, the role of uh, aberrant inflammation in uh, dementia, uh, centrality in uh, transplant and its rejection, um, uh, uh, some of the comorbidities of infection, um, and uh, accelerated vascular disease, and uh, in particular, an interest of mine, is the role of inflammation in HIV disease, even in patients who are immunologically controlled. So if we take the larger frame um, and look at IMIDs, uh, this is a, an extraordinary number of patients. All right, so I will talk about rheumatoid arthritis. And just to kind of ground ourselves, this is a, a prevalent disease, maybe 1% of the population. Um, we have a molecular nosology of rheumatoid. We don't talk about it in other ways. You're either ACPA positive, uh, anti-citrullinated protein antibodies, sometimes call them CCP, uh, or you're ACPA negative. Uh, means a lot. It's associated with different genes, prognosis, mortality, et cetera. Um, one of the things that I'll point out to you, because this is so important to us, is that these antibodies often predate the onset of the disease by uh, years or decades. 
and uh, that means something in pathogenesis. And if you just go into a, um, a population who happens to be ACPA positive, who just has nonspecific aches and pains, chances of rheumatoid in four years are pretty high. Now, rheumatoid arthritis is the disease that canonically we think of as causing this destructive arthritis. Uh, but actually it's a much larger disease and it's associated with numerous comorbidities um, uh, uh, ranging from uh, metabolic and osteoporotic, um, uh, 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 rheumatoid involvement of the lung. Patients on all our diseases get infections. This is bad news uh, for patients, bad news for our management. Um, and up in the upper left, uh, before the days of aggressive therapy, uh, the mortality of rheumatoid is very high um, uh, from accelerated cardiovascular disease. In fact, in the pre-biologic era, it rivaled um, uh, people uh, with three-vessel coronary artery disease, um, uh, and that's changed a bit. But it is a large disease, and uh, the, uh, it, I'm trying to make this point to, to start off with. Now, this is a figure that uh, came from an article by... Uh, a uh, good friend of ours, uh, uh, Paul Emery. And uh, it, it shows the way we look at rheumatoid now. If you look at the uh, kind of uh, homunculus over there on the, on the right with all the inflamed joints, that's a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. Everybody would recognize that. Um, and if you look at the, down over at the left, this is a patient who carries susceptibility genes. And they're perfectly healthy in every way, shape, or form. Now, in between, there are some stages that are expressed as iterative, but they may not be uh, 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 iterative in, 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 a, in a linear fashion. Um, the phase B says engagement with environmental factors, and I, I'll come back to that. It's a social element of this, um, uh, uh, and certain behaviors that are clear risk factors. You see the person smoking a cigarette. The, the, the enlarged uh, figure, phase C, is what we refer to as asymptomatic autoimmunity. And this is a big deal. And these are people that have uh, breach tolerance, have autoantibodies, but have absolutely no signs or symptoms. Totally unaware of this. And some of them may go on to arthritis, some of them may not. Now, I'm talking about rheumatoid arthritis, but there are other models of this. They're not as neatly packaged as ACPA. Uh, but asymptomatic uh, phases of autoimmunity are now uh, increasingly recognized. Uh, I'm not going to segue into talking about cancer immunotherapy, but uh, uh, as everyone is probably aware, uh, the drugs that are now used to treat so many cancers unmask autoimmune diseases, and uh, we're finding that patients, uh, many patients who have cancer have asymptomatic autoimmunity. Uh, moving to the right, we have uh, some symptoms, maybe a little uh, undifferentiated arthritis, just a joint. You can't diagnose rheumatoid arthritis to someone with just one or two joints. And then classic disease. Some people just explode onto the stage. Other people just is just so insidious and goes on for many, many, many years. We're going to come back to this uh, repeatedly as we talk about uh, some of these efforts that were um, adjunctively um, using uh, to address this disease. Now this I think you'll find of interest. Uh, you know, uh, if you have this antibody, this ACPA antibody, um, the ch if you find this in a blood bank screening, getting rheumatoid arthritis is not inevitable. Um, and over a period of three years, um, uh, you know, maybe uh, 20 or 30 percent. But if you add some lifestyle issues, smoke and you're obese, 60%. If you're non-smoker and non-obese, 2%. So there's a huge environmental um, and lifestyle um, uh, axis uh, in this pre-rheumatoid arthritis. And we don't like to use that word, but I, I'm going to use it today because I think it, it, it resonates. Now, this is... <clears throat> This is uh, uh, so important. Uh, I just want to take a, a moment here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all in in our uh, work in terms of biobehavioral and social medicine approaches to patients with IMIDS. 
But I want to emphasize uh, to you, uh, who we work with uh, closely and I value uh, uh, profoundly, uh, the recognition that we now have some extraordinary therapies uh, for these diseases. And uh, uh, there can be no doubt uh, that these have literally raised the bar um, and have transformed the management of these diseases. And I'll show you one slide. Um, this is, a, a, this is a, a, a classic study of uh, uh, the first, one of the first um, TNF inhibitors from uh, almost two decades ago. It's called the ATTRACT trial. And what you're looking here, these, uh, the, the y-axis is the progression of destructive damage in bone. Scale's not important. Uh, yellow is very high, uh, extraordinarily high progression of this. And this is actually just looking uh, over um, uh, 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 a couple year period of time. So um, uh, these are people uh, being treated with methotrexate on the left. And you can see that, the, 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 just taking my word for this, there's kind of unbridled progression of bone destruction. And as bones are destroyed, that in, uh, imparts disability. And this was something that even with methotrexate, uh, the cornerstone of therapy of this disease, um, uh, for many, many decades, we could not stop in the vast majority of people. Now, you don't have to be a statistician to look to see what's happening with the addition of the TNF inhibitor infliximab onto methotrexate background. And if you just look at the last group, quite remarkable, uh, at a very high dose, um, after two years, not only was there no radiographic progression, but even maybe a little bit of healing going the other way. So there's no substitute for these drugs in terms of this. This is, this is, this is part of the background of, of the way we treat these people um, in the right setting, the right indication. And it is uh, truly, um, uh, as I say, transforming the management and the outcomes of these diseases. Now having said that, it's really not enough. And uh, we have lots uh, more issues than this, but uh, um, I make the point. Uh, wellness, uh, I'm speaking to a group that is well uh, versed in this notion of wellness and uh, this is something that I, I like to talk about with rheumatology and IMID treating physicians where this has been uh, um, uh, given uh, uh, not as much emphasis as the treatment of the active phase of the disease. Uh, many paradigms of what wellness is, I love this paradigm of uh, signs and symptoms, diagnosis, and sickness. Um, uh, that, you know, signs and symptoms are the patient's business. I hurt, I'm tired, I have this rash, I have diarrhea, I have something. The diagnosis is our business. And we take this and we contextualize it and we say, you have this. And, and you know, whatever basis that is. The sickness, on the other hand, the sickness is how the disease affects the patient in the totality of their life. You know, the, the, we can stop this radiographic progression in these fingers, uh, but it's really not that which is the, um, uh, the uh, detracting from the quality of life of this patient. Maybe something totally different. This is a paradigm that uh, has been proffered um, by Eric Cassell the uh, extraordinary um, uh, humanist uh, of, uh, uh, of our time in medicine. And I keep the nature of healing on my desk. Um, I, I, I read it often. Um, he, he, he suggests that sickness occurs in the whole person. He says that you know, whatever happens to one part of the person, it happens to, happens to the, 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 the whole uh, being. And, and he rejects any notion of dualism uh, between uh, sickness uh, and disease. It, 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 he says it cannot be otherwise. It's really about the whole patient. Um, so wellness can be wrapped up into uh, some more succinct points that it's more than signs and symptoms or that diagnosis. Um, really encompasses all these diverse dimensions of mind, body, and spirit. It includes a lot of personal choices. And this is something that, 
um, uh, traditional IMID kind of treating doctors, you know, have not been focused on until very uh, recently. Uh, and that uh, 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 the goals uh, of achieving uh, vitality and mental alacrity and social satisfaction and personal fulfillment, you know, I'm finding this so interesting right now um, uh, by the, the incorporation of promise skills in our, in our uh, patients. I, I'm totally uh, Im impressed each and every day, and I can't wait till we can share this more formally with our patients. And I was just showing one of my patients yesterday that, you know, the disease looked like it was doing okay, and the promise scale suggests the quality of life was just in the trash bin. And, you know, it really prompted me to address, like, what the heck's going on here uh, 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 in this? You know, with all this introduction, I think that all of us recognize that wellness occurs when lives go well. Now, I'd like to point out an extraordinarily interesting um, uh, uh, article um, from just uh, a week or two. I just added the slide uh, yesterday. This is a part of the Medicine and Society series from uh, the New England Journal. Um, and this is uh, uh, Green and uh, Los Calzo. And so it's putting the patient back together, social medicine, network medicine, and the limits of reductionism. And from a medical historical point, uh, it's, it's so fascinating. I, I just want to digress for a second. It takes the person, has the disease that, you know, what we gave them, and it kind of looks at it historically. You know, uh, in the 17th century, this would be Sydenham. Uh, creating a nosology, and this is what this illness is. You know, you look like this person, you must have some disease. We classify it, and that's about all they knew. They knew that disease resided in organs. This is Morgani, this is antedated this person, but really this lung picture here is the early um, uh, 19th century where French physicians could correlate, you know, what was going on when they auscultated the lung and then when they did the autopsy and saw this tuberculous um, uh, cavity. Rapidly moving forward, you know, taking this to the level of the tissues now, you know, Bichat in, in France uh, said that all disease seat was seated in tissues and then microscopy uh, with Virchow. Um, and then today, <clears throat> this notion of molecular reduc reductionism, where we look at clouds of data, um, um, uh, uh, trying to understand what's going on. Well, it's all well and good, um, but a more holistic uh, vision of network medicine that they propose, he says it's dependent upon a field of atomized parts. This is the omics that we've talked about at your grand round so many times. Uh, genes, proteomics, metabolomics, all this stuff yet with a, an appreciation that there's profound limitations of this. Um, you know, the whole notion that the gene project would answer all our problems just opened up more problems uh, to be solved. So they propose that, you know, there's even more reason today to look at a, a biosocial approach to medicine, which now in, includes networking of all of these um, with social and environmental factors. Totally appropriate to this. I, 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 you should do this for a journal club. It's fabulous. All right, so now I'm still leading up to the data. This is all data driven. So I want to just uh, uh, pivot for a second and say, what triggers an immune response? These are all immune diseases. What are the things that uh, can do this? Well, you know, we're so used to thinking, well, it's foreign antigens, infection, it's this, that, and the other thing that triggers an antibody or cell-mediated response. I think about this in terms of infections. It's so easy for me to understand, but it's really more than that. They are danger signals. The danger theor uh, theory of immune triggering has been with us for 20 years right now. Um, and we understand that in terms of an environmental influence, but it's been refined. It's not just infections. We're all carrying tons of infections all the time. Our immune system is quiet. Danger can be defined in different ways. Canonically, it is uh, uh, intrinsic. Here you have the notion that there are uh, uh, pathogens that have specific uh, uh, patterns on them that are recognized by these pattern receptors that we call PAMPs, um, toll receptors, RIGs, NODs, others, um, that uh, generate uh, uh, immune activation and immune response. We also know that there are internal danger signals. 
you know, as our tissues degrade dysfunctionally, uh, hypomethylated DNA, stress proteins, um, uh, uh, ER stress, uh, all can trigger the immune system. So this is a notion that we've lived with now for um, uh, well over a decade. But more recently, um, and equally uh, 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 strong evidence, though we don't have the granularity of, of uh, knowledge about it, is the notion that um, there are other forms of danger uh, that are extrinsic to the host that are, prob that are no doubt mediated by this elaborate and complex um, neuropsychoendocrinologic uh, axis. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, uh, I've been to many of your grand rounds where these have been discussed, um, and that we do know that uh, when there is um, a, a danger signal centrally um, to the host uh, that recognizes this in a psychosocial contact, context, um, there is an uh, endocrine discharge uh, that um, uh, at least that superficially we see uh, 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 elevations of ACTH and uh, glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids can serve to suppress uh, type 1 interferons, which protect us from antiviral immunity, and also can suppress um, uh, inflammatory pathways. And uh, over time, as we secrete chronic glucocorticoids, those pathways become resistant to that. And we recognize that endocrine link. We also recognize the sympathetic nerve uh, discharge and its ability to in, uh, impart a same type of uh, molecular pattern of suppression of um, uh, type 1 interferon pathways. Uh, but uh, 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 instead of suppressing uh, inflammatory pathways mm -hmm. to activate them. So here you have this uh, uh, rich literature um, that is sitting separately over here. And people who take care of IMIDs are sitting quietly over here. And now we're going to try to, to uh, think about how these may be put together, how these central mechanisms may be uh, operant. Um, now can be thought about in terms of our modern day uh, stresses, um, uh, which lead to this dysfunctional um, uh, uh, immune activation signal, and environmental, um, the issues of everything that affects us in our uh, food and air and water, et cetera. So um, triggering the immune system in image, this dysregulated inflammatory cytokine milieu, uh, is far more complicated um, than when we started to interdict uh, with our biologic medicines just two decades ago. The tools um, of behavioral medicine in the treatment of IMIDs largely relate to the uh, behaviors of life, um, of how we eat, how we move, how we sleep, and how we <coughs> uh, 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 modulate um, the stresses in our lives obviously built on a profound um, um, uh, base um, that eliminating unhealthy behavior um, comes before all of this uh, mm -hmm. uh, excesses of alcohol or drug use or smoking or carcinogen exposure and um, uh, morbid obesity, et cetera. So I'm giving you snapshots. The rest of this now, as I want to review with you, of taking rheumatoid arthritis, what are the data? And what are we doing about it? Well, all right, let's go back to our kind of um, uh, notion of pre-rheumatoid. So that means that we know the patient's going to have rheumatoid. Or this linear uh, array of disease progression, where we have genetic and environmental risks at one end, uh, classical disease at the other end. Well, along the way, asymptomatic autoimmunity, early symptoms, if we interdict biobehaviorally, not only do we probably have different tools to use, but clearly different outcomes. A person that's in a wheelchair because they've destroyed all their joints, we're not going to have nearly the effect as the person who's genetically predisposed who has environmental risk factors. This is, uh, uh, speaks for itself. So what are some data? Let me just give you a little bit of data for each of these things. I'm going to fly through this, not in a hypercritical way, just to remind you um, of what we know. So arthritis and diet is a big area. 
um, and uh, uh, one that is uh, poorly appreciated. And most rheumatologists do not address diet in terms of uh, their patients other than for weight control. Yet there's a rich diet that shows that um, the distribution of polyunsaturated fat content uh, can make a difference. And there have been a number of studies, including uh, randomized controlled trials and meta-analysis that suggest that um, higher doses of, uh, of uh, um, uh, EP, uh, EPA and DHA, uh, 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 healthy omega-3s, um, can have an effect on disease activity. When I say disease activity, I mean tender, swollen joints, pain, uh, quality of life. So these are things that we measure in our core values. Um, Mediterranean diet has not been looked um, uh, other than small prospective studies and cross-sectional studies. And dietary studies in arthritis that goes over 20 years are very, very difficult. And the, and the data are not uh, as uh, robust, uh, but there are hints um, that moving in the direction of uh, an anti-inflammatory Mediterranean diet, similar um, to enriching content of um, uh, omega-3s can be helpful. Now, more importantly, and this, I, I, I have the abstract, and the, and the paper just came out uh, uh, two months ago uh, in our journal, lead journal, The Annals of the Rheumatic Disease. Um, this is the uh, uh, women's health study. This uh, looks at 100,000 women, studied them over two decades. Um, and out of this, so much data has come, and you've seen data from women's health. So out of 100,000 women, uh, six, 700 of them ultimately develop rheumatoid arthritis over 20 years. It's like, you know, 1% and you get, you're getting there. And they asked the question, well, what did diet have to do with this thing? What did diet have to do with it? So every two years they reappraise diet, so they have multiple data points. And uh, just to, to make this, uh, I, I've taken a, a little bit of data to show you. So they, they took diet. Um, and they divide that uh, into um, uh, two groups. Those that have uh, the standard American diet, SAD diet, and those that had a prudent diet. Prudent diet, a term uh, you're well familiar with in terms of uh, dietary um, uh, 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 scientific uh, lexicon. Um, the extreme end of the prudent diet would be uh, vegan, um, interquartile, um, uh, uh, variations would be um, liberal, vegan, vegetarian, um, and in the middle, there would be the, the uh, 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 cutting the difference between the most prudent and the, the saddest uh, American diet that the, they could have. And so moving up the other end, that interquartile variations went to the unhealthy direction. Now, I'm just, um, I'm going to show you uh, uh, some of the data. This is an adjusted analysis, adjusted for age, smoking, obesity, BMI, and income. And these are the um, uh, 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 relative risks of developing rheumatoid arthritis merely based on this dietary analysis, this serial dietary analysis. So these are um, the, the, the healthiest quartile on the far left and the um, uh, other end is the unhealthiest quartile. All of these were statistically significant. Um, and um, uh, the paper that finally came out showed that this is far more impactful for the women under the age of 55 than over the age of 55. And that probably means that there's risk partitioning. When we get older, we have other reasons to have inflammation. But just one snippet of data. Um, um, uh, 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 shows us the power of this. Another recent study from last year from Dan Solomon, Joan Bathon, and others, merely looking cross-sectionally at a large population of, uh, a, a, a well-defined population of rheumatoid. It wasn't a large population. And they basically asked the question, Let's look at disease activity defined by one of our composite measures, the DAS. This is, this is the, the, the gold standard, tender, swollen joints, pain, um, quality of life. And say, you eat no fish, you eat fish once a month, you eat fish twice a week. And as you can see, as you can see, looking at um, uh, the numbers, 
even though you don't recognize the magnitude of this, a fall of 0.65 in DAS units by just saying you eat fish or no eat fish, this is meaningful. A 1.2 movement of the DAS is a, a significant response to a drug like a biologic. So merely um, uh, 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 adding um, uh, uh, healthy food uh, uh, in, 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 in terms of our environmental interaction, uh, there are data that this is helpful. The skeptic will say, well, I can give rituximab and shut off the um, uh, uh, progression of this disease and move the DAS 2.0. Um, the holistic physician would say that no matter what you're doing, um, we're adding um, uh, not only uh, uh, feeding, uh, 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 using food that is medicine to control disease activity, but also having other dimensions um, in the patient's uh, overall health. Um, not all data are as conclusive. Uh, as I say, these are complicated studies. Uh, this um, limited uh, meta-analysis from four years ago uh, 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 could not um, uh, confirm uh, the effect sizes of these. And uh, this is a work in progress, uh, but it is very much closer to the beginning than the end. These are some data looking at disease activity, the same kind of measure, and here looking at it in a percentage fall, merely looking at weight loss. And you can interpret this many ways. You know, how did they lose their weight? What were they eating? Uh, what are the effect of um, uh, lipid mediated uh, cytokines uh, such as uh, leptin and visfatin and resistin. Um, but there is clearly a relationship between uh, lowered weight um, and improved disease activity. I also showed you it was an environmental risk factor for developing the disease. So collectively, there are a lot of notions here that diet does have an effect in this disease. Now let me segue, and I'm going to, uh, I, I would like to talk about exercise, and I'm going to use this as the barometer. One of the most feared complications in patients that we use immunosuppressives, glucocorticoids, methotrexate, biologic agents, are the increase in infections. And they may be ubiquitous infections, they may be serious infections, they may be opportunistic infections. One of the things that we do know, uh, this is a slide given to me by uh, my friend David Neiman, who was a, a visiting professor uh, with us just a month ago, is that um, if we look at this um, matrix here as these, this is the risk of, uh, of respiratory infection during a given cold and flu season that we are in right now. This is elevated risk above the line, and this is uh, reduced risk below the line, that there is a J-shaped curve which uh, is influenced by moderate exercise um, uh, favorably. Um, this is the patient who is most sedentary, um, uh, with a uh, baseline risk of uh, uh, respiratory infections. There are data, which I will uh, show you summaries of, that show that uh, achieving our moderate exercise goal and just looking at 150 minutes of moderate to high uh, physical activity um, uh, 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 per week uh, will drive this down significantly. And that also there are data to suggest that overtraining, physiologically overreaching, um, uh, uh, serves to increase the risk of respiratory infections. Um, uh, and this protective effect can be 40 to 50 percent, um, uh, and the risk factor of, um, of uh, uh, overdoing it can be even greater. Um, some of the data uh, uh, that uh, uh, belies this uh, uh, has been around for uh, a long time. Um, uh, all of these have shown the same thread. Um, that moderate exercise is helpful, that overtraining is uh, deleterious. I give these to you for uh, your own uh, perusal at a, a later time. This is a, a study from North Carolina of 1,000 adults um, followed for 12 weeks during uh, winter and fall seasons, um, looking at the risk of respiratory infections. And you can see that uh, in this uh, uh, group, there is a 48% fall. Um, and this is looking at uh, exercise patterns. This is the no exercise, um, um, the medium and high. These are not uh, uh, ultra marathoners. It's just uh, 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 the highest tertile of risk. Um, uh, uh, again, 
uh, showing that um, it is a pretty uh, strong protector, not as strong as being young versus being old, but uh, this is uh, modifiable, and as uh, far as I know, that one's not. Um, systemic inflammation uh, relating to uh, body mass index and exercise is a, is a, is a uh, point of interest to all of us. We know that fat is an immunologically active organ. Uh, white fat, uh, nascently, um, is uh, not an inflammatory organ. Uh, the the um, uh, inflammatory cells which reside in white fat uh, in people without uh, metabolic syndrome, central obesity, um, uh, these cells are quiescent and immunoregulatory. In the presence of um, uh, positive energy balance, um, these become polarized into inflammatory cells um, and are the source of inflammatory cytokines as well as some of the uh, dysfunctional lipids um, that affect this population. Uh, we know that um, uh, looking at CRP, which is incorporated into all our disease activity uh, indices, is influenced by body mass index uh, going up. Um, uh, we know that males are less than females, and it's probably related to uh, uh, fat content. Um, and um, that exercise uh, can be very helpful at driving uh, this down. So um, exercise. And then finally, I'll make a point that um, uh, there are epidemiologic data from Scandinavia, similar to the women's health, not as powerful, but a 30,000 person study showing that interquartile uh, uh, distribution of exercise actually statistically reduces the risk of incident rheumatoid arthritis when followed over a long period of time. So here's two behaviors, um, uh, prudent uh, diet um, uh, uh, as a risk factor, um, uh, a uh, anti-inflammatory diet as a modifiable uh, 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 factor of disease, um, exercise to protect from a comorbidity, um, and um, uh, uh, may have an influence on risk. Now, finally, let me bring you to the last axis that uh, is uh, very intriguing to us, and uh, I'm going to close on some of the work that we're, we're uh, planning. Um, there's no doubt that effective disturbances in RA mood um, uh, are, are directly related, that we process uh, pain um, uh, uh, centrally, that uh, inflammatory pathways, this uh, neuropsychoendocrinologic access is uh, um, uh, operating. I'll also do a shout out to Dr. Carmen Goda tomorrow, who is going to be giving medical grand rounds on uh, the approach to fibromyalgia. And she's uh, an extraordinary authority on this. I really strongly urge you to go. I'm looking forward to it myself. Um, there are numerous modalities that have been used as intervention in RA. Uh, CBT, um, and this has been looked at as kind of a self-efficacy uh, type of approach. There are very few um, uh, uh, studies in mindfulness meditation, and most of them have used the standard bearer uh, mind-body, uh, mind-based stress reduction, um, robust um, eight-week program um, uh, uh, as, that you're well familiar with, um, and then uh, self-management approaches which have been shown to improve the management of this. And rheumatologists have interpreted this as, well, we're just improving the efficacy of your disease, you take your medicines better, you're a happier person. Uh, it's kind of the dualistic view of disease that, that I started out with. Today, I think we have much more of an integrated uh, view. So the potential of mind-body interventions in rheumatoid arthritis are great, and, the, and, and it, now the devil's in the details. This is where science becomes important. It's not just um, you know, uh, enough to say de-stress. It, what are we talking about? If you go to the NIH website and look at mind-body practices, you come up with dozens of mind-body practices. And it's just a partial list. And uh, you know, while we certainly can understand meditation um, and the, the power of uh, prayer uh, and spirituality, um, the, you know, the relaxation response, some of these mind-body techniques such as Qigong and uh, Tai Chi, uh, yoga, um, uh, all of them uh, are, uh, are potential interventions. But what are the data and what are the differences between these? So th this is a horizon of research that um, uh, really um, 
needs uh, to be uh, looked at. So I, I've, I've divided some into secular and religious, uh, some that use focus attention versus open monitoring I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and um, the others are uh, asking the question, are you really looking at the effects during the techniques or uh, something that happens to you uh, afterwards, the so-called uh, trait um, uh, uh, results. I like to divide uh, mindfulness uh, and uh, mind-body techniques into those that are top-down and those that are bottom-up. Top-down are those uh, uh, that are really mindfulness meditation oriented. The bottom-up incorporate physicality. So they'd be mind-body. You know, think of Tai Chi, Qigong, um, uh, or yoga. And, and I think that there's uh, much to be said about the data for each of these groups. In, in the next couple of minutes, I just want to review with you some bullet points. This was a seminal paper, and it's old, but I put it in here. Um, this was uh, from the New York Academy of Sciences in 2009. This was the first systematic review of uh, RCTs um, looking at um, uh, the effects on the immune system. I've added some studies to these bullet points, and I will, I'll just make a point that um, these are looking at uh, uh, classical top-down techniques, um, and all of them show a trend in terms of affecting circula circulating um, uh, inflammatory cytokines as reducing inflammatory cytokines. The most sensitive marker has been IL-6. Um, the effects on CRP have been far less uh, convincing. This may be effect size. This may be um, uh, risk partitioning. Um, much more difficult to show. Now, when I'm telling you that the, the, in this systematic review, we're looking at um, uh, you know, a few handfuls of mindfulness-based studies, immediately in your head, it's like, well, what studies were they? Is this mind-body stress reduction? Was this Tai Chi? Was this just uh, six minutes or uh, 60 minutes, uh, et cetera? The devils are in the details, but I'm giving you this 30,000 foot view to show that there are data um, that have been uh, critically reviewed um, and ongoingly reviewed uh, for this. There's even more interesting data uh, now coming out um, uh, in uh, the effects of mindfulness and immune aging. This is a topic of itself. I'd like, I think that you guys should be doing a grand rounds on this um, uh, uh, soon. Um, and the best uh, done studies, these three studies uh, looking at telomerase, these have been added since 2009. Um, and some of this work is done by uh, world leaders like Elizabeth Blackburn and um, uh, Alyssa Eppel, um, basically showing that uh, vigorous um, and um, uh, you know, forthright uh, meditation um, uh, engagement um, can show um, uh, increases in telomerase and stabilizations of uh, telomere length, um, uh, 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 which are uh, 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 very important in IMIDs. Rheumatoid arthritis is a disease of accelerated uh, telomere shortening um, and uh, 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 lowered telomerase levels. No, there have been no studies in mindfulness meditation on um, immunologic aging in patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and I'm just starting to look at other images right now, but most of this is done either on healthy people or people uh, with um, uh, stressors uh, that are known to be associated with this, uh, cancer survivors, um, attendance of patients with terminal diseases. This is a very recent um, uh, review uh, that uh, we've just uh, uh, looked at. It's a systematic review. Uh, from 2017 on the influence of mindfulness techniques on gene expression. And this is probably the most robust data that we have. Um, and uh, the, at the present time, there are 18 relevant studies that were included in this. And virtually all of them, no matter what the technique, um, show downregulation of these central inflammatory pathways. NF-kappa-B is the uh, pathway that is upregulated by stress, um, um, and uh, this is the pathway that is downregulated um, by engaging in um, uh, mindfulness meditation. What is remarkable that a single study demonstrated that you can influence gene expression with as little as one 
day retreat of novice um, um, uh, uh, mindful um, uh, subjects. So this is, uh, this, this is uh, uh, the, the horizon uh, that we are looking at. This is one of the uh, first studies that uh, really showed this. Uh, this is Dusek. This was working uh, with Herbert Benson's group. And this is basically looking at a relaxation response, non-spiritual, uh, 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 kind of mantra-based, um, uh, so much literature on this, secular technique, um, looking at three populations, control population over here, which is different from these two. Um, this is experienced people um, uh, who uh, were involved in uh, mindfulness meditation techniques. And this was a, um, a very short uh, eight-week uh, trainee group um, in relaxation response, showing totally different heat maps um, uh, than the control uh, group. So uh, this is a horizon that we want to explore. And finally, um, uh, a, a recent study showing uh, the effect of Tai Chi in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and one of the, uh, the, the most critical uh, comorbidities that we have, which uh, is uh, 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 accelerated vascular disease, showing um, a statistical effect of Tai Chi on uh, reversing endothelial dysfunction. So a, a bottom-up technique, top-down techniques, all moving ahead. Now, the last few minutes... I'm talking very rapidly, I'm throwing out a lot of data, and I, I want to ensure um, that this does not uh, have uh, the patina of zealotry, because it doesn't. This is all data-driven. Yet, in a, in a short period of time, just high-level data doesn't uh, give us the, the, the devil, which is always in the details. So, you know, Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary data. And every time that you see something that says, you know, mindfulness meditation is good for you, um, you have to really ask, does it have signs of bad science? I'm, I'll suggest the, I, I like to, uh, my talks, recommend books. I don't know, anybody who's read Altered Traits yet? All right, great. A couple people here. Fabulous book. Interesting, just the sub rosa part of this is that um, it is, uh, it, I, I don't think it's selling like hotcakes because it's pretty scientific. And people on Amazon, was, somebody said, like, it didn't tell me anything. So this is like the, one of the greatest books I have read in the last several years because it's a, a very careful and thoughtful um, um, uh, 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 analysis of the limitations of the scientific data on this, written by Richard Davidson and uh, Daniel Goleman, two of the leaders. They say, you know, you know, just because you study a yogi who's, who's meditated for 60,000 hours and show that his brain looks different, that doesn't mean that if you use headspace for three minutes that your brain's going to look like that. So what is the dose? What is the type? What are the measurements? Can this be reproduced? Um, what are the designs of the experiments? You know, we look at um, uh, some of these data. We should be... Um, paying attention of these be beginner um, uh, uh, meditators of less than 100 hours, are they long-term or are they, you know, the Olympians of, of uh, mindfulness meditation? So where do the data come from? What is the type of meditation that's being used? Is it, you know, attentional, like relaxation response? Um, or is it more deconstructive, like uh, vipassana uh, meditation, uh, which uses focused observation, but kind of de uh, deconstructs the nature of, you know, the mental experience? Um, um, or is it, you know, more of a meta approach, um, like uh, cognitively based compassionate therapy, uh, which we've uh, brought to the clinic? Um, all of these uh, are, are variables in, in how we are using it. Most of the literature is based on MBSR. Um, this is the gold standard. This is, you know, developed as a, a secular uh, but uh, Buddhist-like approach uh, that is uh, intense. Um, Eight-hour orientation, day of silence, 45, 50, 60 minutes a day, etc. I, I think that the, the data are fairly clear that this is effective. But the question is, you know, where are we now? That mind-body stress reduction is not a high-throughput therapy. 
If you just said that's the, that's the treatment and you do an intention to treat study, most people can't do it. They just can't engage. So now we're interested in looking at this, the deep and the wide. You know, yogis, serious lifelong meditators, level three is MBSR. These are people good, but what about four and five? Four is now what we're all talking about. You know, more accessible um, techniques. Um, are, you know, stress-free now, Headspace, all the millions of apps that are out there. And then level five is to come, you know, the, the, the distilled science of this, you know, that um, I, heard, uh, I heard Dr. Chopra uh, at, at a thing last year. He said that he was working with some neuroscientist and he had all this incredible data from this um, study of his. And he, said, and he asked this neuroscientist, and I, I can't remember who it was. He says, okay, he goes, you convinced now that meditation works? He goes, I am. And he goes, are you going to start meditating? And he said, no. And he said, why not? He goes, I'm going to make a pill. So the final couple minutes here, uh, it, we're interested in making this high throughput. And we're interested in developing a behavioral approach to IMIDs. Um, and uh, we're taking, uh, extracting from a lot of uh, the things that are out there to ask, what can we do to affect the behavior of our patients um, and uh, uh, bring this uh, in a studied way? So I've given some of my monographs uh, in the back. This is something that I developed over the past decade. It's paper. People read it. They don't read it. The ones that engage, I've been very impressed that we do a lot of good with. But I thought, like, this is trying to chop a tree down with a, you know, a, a Swiss Army knife. So last year I became motivated um, uh, to try to rethink this notion of behavioral approach to image. And now working uh, with uh, Dr. Husney, um, and uh, the wellness group, and we are uh, well on our way of developing an online um, personal empowerment model of biobehavioral change for patients with IMIDs. We call it immune strength. Uh, we exploit the same type of wellness behavior that you um, uh, value. Um, value of uh, prudent diet, uh, exercise, stress reduction, and sleep hygiene. But it's packaged in the context of explaining to people that if they have IMID, and there are 50 million people with IMIDs, how these behaviors influence their immune response. There's copious data on personal empowerment models that if you can link the disease uh, in a cognitive way, you will get better outcomes. This will be a 10-week online program. It will be e-coached. Um, uh, it will um, uh, start with a lot of cognitive um, uh, uh, reinforcement, uh, such as our, our monograph of uh, why um, uh, immune system are dysfunctional in these diseases and how behaviors influence it. Um, we will incorporate promise scales. People will see their own quality of life right from the beginning. They'll have a baseline assessment. Um, they will have some flexibility, uh, but they will be um, um, uh, tutored in stress reduction with uh, uh, Stress Free Now, our um, online program, which uh, I give out uh, every day. Um, uh, sleep Now, variation. Uh, we're building an exercise program and we're uh, devising a special nutrition program emphasizing anti-inflammatory. At the end of the day, that will be a, 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 a intervention. And this is what we're going to try to answer. Once we have that intervention, it's beta tested, and we can show that we can take image patients and put it through. We want to know, can this online coach program targeting wellness behaviors improve quality of life with patients of IMIDS? Can it improve disease activity in patients with IMIDS? Can it um, uh, improve immune parameters? And finally, can we look in terms of these, these clouds of data um, to say, does immunologic wellness have a biologic signature? So in my last 
10 seconds, I'll give my shameless marketing. Um, if you're interested in immunologic health, uh, March 9th and 10th, uh, Miami, Florida, uh, the sixth annual basic uh, clinical immunology for the busy clinician. We call this immunology boot camp. Uh, one day of hardcore uh, immunology. The second day um, is going to feature this new module on immunologic health. Um, and uh, a lot of people from uh, uh, clinic are going to be participating, um, and we will be exploring in a whole half day what I just did for you in the last 45 minutes. So I think I'll stop right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are limited with time, so if we could have one or two questions, and then um, afterwards, if uh, Dr. Calabrese is available for talk, a question. Oh. Thank you. That was a excellent discussion. One of the challenges I have is in patient care is really trying to understand how best to both empower the patient with behavioral changes and starting and sustaining uh, BMRs and disease modifying agents that we know are transformative in terms of improving morbidity and mortality in infants. Um, so how do you look at uh, a patient, this is a new territory, we are referring, I know I am referring to functional medicine and wellness, and you know, really you have limited time with a patient um, and you want to you know, really communicate both these things. And as you know, we are interested in studying you know, whether there's a molecular signature when um, having these added um, treatment paradigms. I mean, yeah, you're hitting it on the head. I, I mean, a part of the motivation, as, as, as you're uh, aware, is that um, uh, you know, we're, we're right in the uh, process of doing a, a needs assessment, uh, actually a, a study of physicians who take care of inmates. Do you believe in this? Um, are you confident that you can educate? What are the barriers that you have for educating? And even if you're buying into this, do you know where to send a patient for this? And the answer to this is mostly no in, in the country. So we're, you know, we, we think that having you know, some type of high throughput scalable thing as an adjunct is important. The empowerment part, I think, is the part that we can do and the advanced practitioners can do. But these are just you know, two berries on the same twig. You know, this is not like, oh, yeah, maybe you should go see somebody integrative, and then we'll take care of you here. This is, this is the notion of wellness, and, and, uh, 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 and Elaine's asking this rhetorically because she buys into this totally, and we're trying to put together a uh, wellness um, uh, study group at our national meeting next year uh, in rheumatology. So um, uh, I think it starts uh, with uh, declarative knowledge uh, to buy in that there are data, and then procedural knowledge of how to do it, and then us... I think our notion of this program is going to be pretty great. That's where I'm going. One more, Brett. Um, so, how do you uh, deal with the problem that a lot of people see with studying these things? In that, um, many times when you're changing a lifestyle factor, you're changing many. And uh, how, how, you know, there's. Um, Typically, we have randomized controlled trials and everything is controlled and we're changing one variable, but in this case, the, the power is really in doing all of these at once. So how do we effectively study that to know that it's effective? It's a very wise question you're answering, asking. Uh, you know, I, I, my engagement with this m lifestyle modification is uh, I've given up on the reductionist approach. I, I was like, you know, stricken with a seizure and knocked off my camel. And I said, you know, we sh I, I, I can't wait to study them one at a time, although the, the reductionism at the molecular level is important. You know, if we're going to really uh, focus on wellness, we have to focus, you know, socially and environmentally. So this is new territory for us, um, and that we're hoping that, you know, the variable of, 
uh, and, and, care, and carefully and clinically, uh, critically appraising the adherence to all of these things. This is not just like saying, go do this and then let's find out. Let's understand in the context of this, can people do all of these at once or can they only do one at a time? So uh, um, yes, it, it limits the pristine nature of the intervention, uh, but it, uh, it has more face uh, uh, validity to me because this is the way we live our lives. So I'm, I'm willing to take the exposure. All right. I'll stick around for another question afterwards. Thank you very much.